Sorry, I was looking for my cue. It's at the back of the room. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to this remarkable opportunity to be a part of a conversation uh, with two of the world's leading jurists. Uh, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto is host to a dizzying array of wonderful speakers and events, but even in that context, today is an extraordinary occasion. It is an honor to have Justice Alina Kagan of the United States, United States Supreme Court and Justice Rosalia Bella of the Supreme Court of Canada join us today. Thank, Thank you, you both very much for being here. With lives and careers that these two uh, distinguished guests have had, I could take up the hour with introductions. Uh, I think merely mentioning their awards and honors would take up most of the hour. But I have a feeling that hearing me talk is not what you came for, and I will be brief. Today's special guest is trailblazing Justice Elena Kagan. A, a bit about her. After clerking and practicing briefly, Justice Kagan began her academic career as a professor at the University of Chicago, swiftly earning a reputation for scholarly brilliance. She then joined the Clinton White House in various roles. On leaving the White House, she became professor and then dean of Harvard Law School, the first woman to hold that post. She was a transformative dean, known for her hard work, intelligence, collegiality, and great judgment. She is credited amongst with many other accomplishments with creating a new and positive sense of unity and community at that great institution. Former colleagues describe her as one of the most successful academic leaders they have ever seen. Another trail was blazed next when President Obama appointed her to the role of Solicitor General of the United States, the first woman to hold that post. President Obama then had the excellent judgment to appoint her to the Supreme Court. She is a leader on the court, known not only for her legal insight, but also for her wonderful legal prose. And of course now, no bio of Justice Kagan would be complete without reference to her honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Toronto <laughs> conferred this morning. Congratulations. I describe Justice Kagan as our special guest only because it is impossible to think of, of Justice Abella as a guest. Not only are we all sitting in her room, <laughs> but we are also sitting in her faculty. She's not just our alum, but a steadfast friend and supporter of our law school. Another honorary doctorate recipient from the University of Toronto, Justice, Justice Abella, as many of you will know, has also had an extraordinary life and career. Born in a displaced persons camp in Germany, a piano prodigy, she has, like Justice Kagan, been a trailblazer her whole life. After graduating from U of T, she was appointed about a minute and a half later to Ontario's Family Law Court at the old age of 29. She was the youngest appointment to the bench in Canada's history and was also the first Jewish woman appointed to the bench in this country. To top it off, she was pregnant at the time. She was later appointed to the Ontario Court of Appeal and then the Supreme Court of Canada. Along with a wonderful legal mind, she shares with Justice Kagan a remarkable judicial pen, and she's used that tool wisely and compassionately. I like to say that the only thing bigger than uh, Justice Abella's legal brain is her heart. Thank you both so very much for being here today. Uh, the format for the discussion will be that Justice Abella and Justice Kagan will spend about a half an hour in conversation with one another, uh, and then we will turn to the audience for questions. It's a majority student uh, audience. I'm hoping that they will give priority to questions from students. So there's going to be microphones at either aisle, and I would please encourage the students to line up to ask your questions of these two wonderful jurists. So thank you again for being here, and Justice Abella, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, Dr. Kagan. That's what he said, Dr. Kagan. <laughs> Dr. Justice Kagan, my wrist hurts a bit here. Can you bend down? Um, nothing to say about that. No. Uh, we are so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for uh, coming to Canada. It's it's a great school and it's a great country and and a great dean. In a great country. You know what we call Harvard, the U of T of the South. 
So I want to thank you for one other thing which I, which I have learned this afternoon, and that is the way for a Canadian Supreme Court judge to get a standing room only audience in Canada is to be on a program with an American Supreme Court. <laughs> Where well, to just because you come back here so often, they're used to you. Chop liver. liver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but this is this is amazing. You have your own mood courtroom. And, and I'm, I'm still, still alive. alive. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just guessing you did not give a gazillion dollars to get your name on that no, door. No, no, I, I cut it off at one smart, million. Yeah. I said that's I all my grandchildren can afford. This is very nice, but the first time I walked in to the Abella Boo courtroom, I found myself saying, I feel like Fred in Spamalot. I'm not dead yet. So let me start with um, something which I'm sure you know. We are so riveted to the American confirmation process, the hearings. We watch, we pay attention. Fair warning. You were going to ask me. You know, we Excuse me, I'm the judge. I don't have to give you that one. So um, we were all glued to our TVs because it's a fascinating thing for nice, gentle Canada to see. But I think I speak for everyone. Do you have any kind of hearings? I hear very well. So let me ask my question because I think it's on everybody's mind who watched the most, most recent, recent hearing. Do you, Do you like, like beer? beer? <laughs> uh, what was your second question? <laughs> Seriously, can I, can I ask you, do you have hearings at all? No, we have the merit, merit system. system. <laughs> no, no. I'm, On. They were laughing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have any hearings? We have um, kind of a hearing. We, there was, you won't be surprised to hear, a lot of discussion in this country about whether we should have the American style hearings. And most of the judges resisted it because our sense was, as you wrote in an article once, people tend to give answers that are pretty anodyne and not terribly revelatory of anything that really matters. But people know you, and there is recognition. I mean, if I walked out on Bloor Street with you, people would say, who's that with Elena Kagan? <laughs> so you have a, a name recognition. The court has recognition. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. It's a, you have a different culture than we have. Yeah. But the question for many of us was, what comes from those hearings that outweighs some of the negative uh, consequences of the hearing. So we have, we started one, we had a very nice judge who did the first one, a really nice guy. He was sweet and adorable and everybody behaved really well and they walked away saying, see, we can do this. Um, and then as time went on, they became somewhat attenuated and now we have vestiges, but nothing like your hearings. Do you think they were? Do you yeah. Like I think it's really hard. I mean, I, I don't think that they work very well in its current form, but nor would I say we should just get rid of them. Uh, you know, I have, I have complicated and mixed feelings about it. I, I do think we're an important institution of governance, and uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the senators who are charged in the Constitution with uh, deciding whether any nominee gets to the Supreme Court, you know, should, should have the ability to take a person's measure. And, um, and the public should have the ability to do the same and to communicate their thoughts, if they have any, to their elected representatives who were charged with that constitutional responsibility. So, uh, so it seems good to me from the perspective of transparency of governance and, and just um, people taking their constitutional roles seriously and having an opportunity to, to see a person and and to try to figure out what kind of justice she or he would be. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, in the abstract, I think that that's a good thing. I think in the concrete, 
uh, it's a little bit hard to watch any of these hearings and think that they accomplish all that much. What was it like to go through one? So, um, yeah, I had a, a, a relatively calm process. I think people, you know, people kind of knew that I was going to get through. I wasn't one of your more controversial nominees. Um, What's that like? But even there, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we have lived in our country for some years now in a very divided system. I think people had a high degree of confidence that I was going to get through, but, but not with a lot of bipartisan voting. I, you know, I got uh, a number of Republicans, but, you know, fewer than 10. I think there were six or seven or something like that. Uh, so even a relatively uncontroversial person is still that the, 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 the expectations were that I would not get uh, very much bipartisan support. And that's been true pretty much of all of us since I think the Chief Justice was the only person who really managed to pick up lots of, uh, lots of support from members of the party who uh, did not nominate him. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's very different from what it was like about, you know, 30, 25 years ago. My colleagues, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Scalia. Right. Uh, I mean, all of these people had strong views, at least as strong as the people who have gotten on the court more recently. And uh, they all got confirmed by votes of like 98 to 2. Yeah. So something very dramatic in the American political system has changed with respect to Supreme Court justices. And it's, it's, it's hard to figure out how to get back to a system where people get the opportunity to question you and to find out whether, you're, whether you have the qualifications to be a judge and whether you are you know, a, a, a person with good judicial values, uh, but then think our job is basically to you know, say yes, as opposed to our job is to, is, is to fight about you. And uh, I, I, I don't, it's hard to know how we ever get back there because uh, the, the, the court in the United States uh, decides you know, many important questions and questions on which the um, population is deeply divided. And so people think of the court as uh, you know, we need our person on it, we need our person on it. And, um, uh, that, that's, that's, I think that's bad for the court, and uh, it, it would be better, I think, if it was all toned down. But I don't know how to get there. The, the fact that the country appears to be in a very different place from where it was 20, 30 years ago, does that argue for a different role for a Supreme Court? Well, I, I think it's, it's clearly true that, uh, that the, 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 it is, this, this is related to the courts taking positions on many controversial issues. And if the court did nothing on the issues that people feel strongly about, and you can name them as well as I can, uh, there would be um, less political controversy surrounding the court and less uh, engagement with the court. But uh, my court, like your court, has a responsibility to um, police the Constitution, you know, police, police the political branches and make sure that they measure up to constitutional commitments and guarantees. And that's sometimes going to take you into controversial areas. So, um, uh, you know, is it a reminder that um, that there is value in uh, judicial modesty and restraint and in uh, what used to be called the passive virtues? Yes, I think it is. But I, th I think it's, um, it's inevitable that my court, like your court, is, um, is, is going to have a voice in some issues that um, members of the public care about. Now, what, what limits are there to your role as an individual judge? You have a set of values, you have a, a judicial philosophy. 
uh, how do you implement that? How do you take the skills you had as a Harvard dean, a consensus builder, uh, and apply them in a setting where it may not be as um, conducive to having people open to coming together on a compromise. So the, the first position is it's good at this time when everybody is so polarized to have an institution that brings people and issues together. Is that possible though, when, when you're in an institution like yours where people are independent minded, yeah. strong, and have very set views. It's possible sometimes, but it's not possible all the time. And for exactly, it's not possible all the time for exactly the reason that you just mentioned. These are nine uh, very smart people who have been around the block once or twice, who have their own views about lots of uh, uh, questions that come before us and about judicial philosophy and method that leads them to give certain answers to, to even new questions that come before us. Um, uh, but all that said, I think it's, it remains possible for people to listen to each other. I think we actually do a pretty good job on the court of, of, of doing that, of, um, of, of actually paying attention to what each other uh, is saying and, um, and, and to trying to reach common ground where we can. And um, you know, sometimes we do it better and sometimes we do it worse. But I do think that there is room in uh, a judicial system, even a judicial system that necessarily decides on many important matters because of the Im important role that it plays uh, in, the, in the constitutional structure. I do think there's room for people to listen to each other and to try to find common ground and to try to find areas of compromise. And I think that the way you do that, no surprise, um, is the way you do it in any institution. It's by, you know, there, uh, the, there are many big questions that people disagree about. And usually, the way to find agreement and the way to find consensus is not to keep talking about those big questions because you're just going to soon run into a wall, um, but to see if you can reframe the question and maybe split off a smaller question. And uh, so, you know, the way to reach compromise and to reach and to uh, gain consensus is to take big divisive questions and make them smaller and less divisive. And um, when people really want to do that, it can often happen. But some of the issues that you've been dealing with, like union checkoff, uh, gay marriage, really don't lend themselves to being reduced to smaller components? Yeah, I mean, some don't, with, not with respect to any particulars, but, uh, you know, some issues look pretty binary. And, um, and, and, um, and when they have that structure, it's awfully hard to get nine people who have different judicial philosophies, who have different ways of approaching constitutional issues to, to get together and decide things. But I will say, I don't think, I think, uh, you know, that's clearly true, but I think that there's a, a, um, a, a greater area than many people think for consensus building. So um, for an extremely unfortunate reason, we were an eight-person court for almost two mm -hmm. years, uh, almost two terms, and that was because Justice Scalia uh, died. Uh, uh, in the middle of the term, but before we had decided very many cases for that term, and, and that seat was unoccupied almost through the next term. So there were two whole years of the Supreme Court's life where we were an eight-person court. And, you know, there's a reason why appellate courts don't have an even number of people, right? <laughs> and that reason is because there are some <laughs> questions that it's like, how do you do it? If it's, if, it's going to, if, it's, if it's an even number of people, we're going to be tied, what are we going to do? And, uh, but all those two years, we tied, uh, when, we, when we do tie, the way the US Supreme Court works, is we, we do something like, it's 4-4, we can't progress any further, it's affirmed by an equally divided court, and we just send it back down, and whatever the decision below was, stands. And I think people were really scared that in those two years uh, that was going to happen quite a lot. And it turned out it happened almost never, that all of us were really committed 
to trying to find common ground and to and really committed to, to to operating in a way that people didn't think that the court had ground to a halt and that the court had stopped working. And um, and so that meant, you know, on a fair number of cases, we did our usual thing. We went around the table, we expressed our views, and then we discussed and we got to the end and it looked like we were 4-4. Four, four. And, uh, and then the Chief Justice would say, well, let's keep on thinking about this and let's keep on talking about this. And whether it was that day or we would go back to our chambers and try to figure out uh, ways to move forward, we almost always did in that position where we had to because we felt if we didn't, it would look to the American public as if the court had uh, ground to a halt. Where we had to, we uh, decided things and we found ways to reframe questions and to break off smaller questions from bigger questions and to reach agreement. Now, some of those agreements were a little bit silly. You know, it was like there was this big question and everybody needed to know the answer to it and the courts were divided and it was really important and we couldn't really decide it. So instead, we decided some other thing that actually nobody cared about. <laughs> So that was true sometimes, but it was also true, it was also true that sometimes we did really good work when we did it like that, where we had to keep thinking and we had to keep saying, you know, is there a way of reframing this where it's not like half the people think it's great and half the people think it's the most horrible thing in the world. And, uh, and especially in a divided time, uh, I think that there is, incredible value to the court trying to do that, trying to find places where it's not that half the country gives you a thumbs up and half the country gives you a thumbs down. And when we had to, we did it. Now, it's a lot harder to do that when you're nine people again. Because when you're nine people again, you go around the table and, you know, we don't decide many of our cases 5-4. I mean, you know, I think everybody outside the United States, maybe some people in the United States, thinks that that's how we do our whole job. 50% of the time, we're unanimous. It's really in a very small uh, percentage of cases where we look deeply divided and are deeply divided. But those cases are often cases that matter and that the American public cares about. Um, and on those cases, when you go around the table and it's 5-4, uh, rather than 4-4, four, four, it's hard for people to say, let's keep talking until we can reach some greater consensus. You know, it's hard for the people, certainly the people, you know, I know for me, if I'm in the five, it's like, we're done, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, um, but I think, I, I, I think that we are also aware, we should be aware, I think often we are aware uh, that there's, there's value to building bridges, there's value to building consensus, uh, there's value to not uh, seeming and not being um, politicized. I don't think we are ever politicized in the way some people might think, but certainly we sometimes uh, appear that way to the American public and uh, and there's lots of value in not being that and uh, if if that means that we go back to our offices and you know think harder about how we can find areas of agreement rather than I think that that's a good thing sometimes it won't be possible most of the cases that you talked about where there is a 5-4 split, as you say, are the ones that the country cares about the most. Yeah, I mean, not all of them. Well, but they're con they tend to be constitutional cases. Yeah. And part of what looks to the outside is happening is that there are two different cultures in the way constitutional law is approached. So you have something like our living tree that grows with the times, you have to stay top of it, there is originalism, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of move between the two groups. Um, there's, there are the levels of scrutiny that seem to be applied in odd ways. Korematsu was subject to strict scrutiny. It's not clear where, where all of that takes you. Um, 
the divide, the philosophical divide in constitutional questions about what the role of the state is, it feels profound from the outside. Uh -huh. And if you slice and dice so that you're only doing the narrow, can it be said that you are subject to the criticism that you're not doing what the public needs you to do? Or is it a way of saying, look, you also need us to retain our legitimacy, and this is the way we do it? Yeah, well, let me, uh, uh, let me split that question into two parts. So the, f the first part, you gave a kind of analysis of why it is that we're sometimes divided on cases. How it looks, yeah. and, reading the judgments. And, and, so I, th I think that this is basically true, that you said it has to do with different views of how to approach our Constitution. And I think that that's right. I mean, I think that it, it, this is, not, you know, sometimes people think, oh, they just, they're politicized in the same sense that Congress is politicized. Uh, you know, there are Democrats and Republicans in Congress, and then there are Democrats and Republicans on the court, and they're kind of doing the same thing. And I completely reject that. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, it's not as, as though we're acting in a partisan kind of way, like what's good for my party. I, I just don't think that that's the way judges think generally, and I know it's not the way that I think or my colleagues think. Um, but I do think that we sometimes uh, mirror in, in, in constitutional cases divides that exist elsewhere in Congress and among the American people. And, and we do that because we do have very different approaches to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So for, let me, and let me compare that to, for example, statutory interpretation. Okay. You know, we will have super important statutory interpretation cases and also cases which have a kind of political valence, if you know what I mean. I mean, you're, you're, um, you're interpreting a statute in a way that uh, the left part of the American public will like and not the right part. The liberals will like and the conservatives won't, or the conservatives will like and the liberals won't. And notwithstanding that, we actually have uh, achieved um, sort of amazing consensus on statutory interpretation. Whichever way it cuts, sometimes it cuts for conservatives, sometimes it cuts for progressives, whichever way it cuts. And the reason we are able to have that kind of consensus is because we have a shared view of how you mm -hmm. do statutory right. interpretation. With, a, with maybe an outlier or two on, 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 on each end of the spectrum, that almost all of us basically approach statutory interpretation questions in the same way, ask the same uh, uh, questions about how to go about giving meaning to a statute. And that produces a set of results that cannot easily be said to be like, oh, the conservatives did the conservative thing and the liberals did the liberal thing. You know, we just don't do that. But when it comes to constitutional cases, people can look at us and say, oh, look at that. You know, the people who were nominated by Republicans are doing one thing, which tends to be the, set, the, the thing that uh, uh, conservatives in Congress would agree with, and, vice, and, 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 and the same on the other side. But it, I think it's because we just have different understandings of how to interpret the Constitution. And, and, is, and that's, that's my question. question. Yeah, and so, that's not, I mean, this is something I think, you tell me, I think is different from this country, is that there are two very different views of what you're doing when you're doing constitutional interpretation. You have two different views, and, and it's an, it, the question is, since you have a consistent approach to statutory interpretation, which I suspect is like ours, what was the intention of the legislature, what did the words mean? But when you're talking about constitutional law, you're talking about the fundamental values of a country. They're aspirational. And that's where you have to have, I think, in a court, and most courts around the world have an approach. They may disagree on how it's to be applied in a particular case, but they have an approach. Right. Yes, we can have, um, we can have international law. Yes, we can have comparative law. Um, yes, the government has to be, uh, has to justify its intrusion in a proportional way. So we have, 
we have a philosophical approach that is unified. Right, so that's, that makes life easier for Much. you. <laughs> Much. Because, because we don't. We have, uh, you know, and th th there is, there's lots of subtlety and lots of nuance that I'm going to ignore when I say this, but we generally have two approaches. Uh, one approach, let's call it originalism, is this approach where you look to what the drafters of the Constitution um, thought when they wrote those words down. Like the statutory interpretation. The what was the intention of the legislature? The original public meaning is what it's called. And it's like, what did people, with those words, that, what did they mean then? And the then is uh, 1789, or the then is, uh, you know, 1868. That's basically the two mm -hmm. alternatives, 1789 for most of the Constitution, but 1868 for the important equal protection and due process clauses that came about as a result of the Civil War. And, uh, and you know, there are different ways of doing originalism, and some people differ even within the originalist camp. But in general, you're basically, it's a, base, it's, it's a, historic, it's a historical inquiry, which asks what they thought, what they understood uh, at, a, at a particular moment in time when the constitutional provision came into effect. And, uh, uh, I think, unlike in this country, uh, that has a, you know, that has, there, there are a, that is a very serious mode of constitutional interpretation in the United States. It's also so, new, isn't it? Well, it wasn't there before 1982 when the Federalist Society was developed because you often had uh, very different approaches until the markers were put down and then it became a divided approach to constitutional law. Yeah, I would say it's, 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 uh, if, if new is within uh, 50 years or so, it's, it, it's, yeah. it's new. Uh, you know, that you, you, it's you know, 1970s, early 1980s, something like that was when it really developed. And, and I have to say, it developed, I think, in response to some serious concerns about the other approach, all right? So the other approach um, is, sure, we look to the original meaning of these provisions, but that doesn't tell us everything. First off, it's often hard to figure out. And even if you could figure it out, um, uh, you know, in the words of John Marshall, our first great chief justice, this is a constitution we're expounding. It's not meant to be frozen at a particular moment in time. And so we also look to uh, historical traditions. We look to sort of history not just at one moment, but over time. We look to how precedent has developed. Um, uh, uh, and depending on, and you know, this too, there are many nuances, many mm -hmm. subtleties. People differ in the, in the way it's done. But some understanding that uh, things change and values change in a society. Um, and that that's reflected in in its, in its history and its traditions and its precedents. And, uh, you know, I think originalism grew out of a sense that that mode of interpretation, which, you know, I'm a, not an originalist, so I associate myself more with looking at the broad sweep of American history and, and with... Uh, That's and with Snyder. Is that the case that kind of started the whole approach to history? Snyder, 37? Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. It's been a while since okay. I've taken uh, it. But I think that there was a sense that that approach uh, was not disciplined enough. You know, it was, you couldn't make up anything. And a bunch of judges would get together and was like, well, how do we think our society should look? And, uh, and do something that didn't seem very law-like to people and that seemed both contested and contestable. Which brings me to one of the other things that you see in the divided court, and that is, okay. Aww. But we're having such a good Aww, time. Just as Sabella told me that she was going to ask me where I got my hair cut. <laughs> and I think that I was, I was, mis I was misinformed about the nature minutes. of this conversation. <laughs> so the divisions in the, in the court bring me to um, the role of the dissent and the tone of some of the dissents, because they are such high-pressure areas where people are fundamentally divided on the court. 
about what society should look like. There, there is language that creeps into some of the dissents that says things like you're making it up, uh, that says who cares about precedent. I, I thought your dissent in Janus was fabulous. Um, where you said, what was wrong with the boot in 1977? That, wor that worked. Why are we changing it now? And you had a judge who kept inviting people to challenge a boot in the courts. So your tone was strong, but it was civil. That isn't always the case. Some people might disagree even on that, right? I mean, I, you know, I try to not step over certain kinds of lines, but, but sometimes I, people read back to me lines, you know, years later, they read certain lines back to me, and I think, oh, maybe I should have left that one on the cutting room floor, right? But you do um, worry about it. I do. It isn't clear that everyone does. I think most people do. Uh, uh, you, you know, look, Justice Scalia was the greatest writer in the modern U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but he had a sharp pen. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, he called him like he saw him. And then, um, and, you know, I, you know, I can do the same thing. And other people uh, can as well. And, uh, you know, we probably, you know, the Canadian niceness thing is... Uh, if you're nice, maybe... they give you a room. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a room? <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, you know, just, so, but I, th I think you're in, uh, you said a... Uh, Five or ten minutes ago, you said something like, there are some things you can't settle on. There are some things you can't compromise on. I think that there is, um, that, that, that is true. Not always true when you think it's true, but sometimes true. Uh, where that is true, I think especially in, again, a pretty polarized time, a pretty divided time, a, a time where you hope that the institutions of governance find ways to bring people together rather than to drive them further apart, and where you fear that they're not accomplishing that obje objective very well, that in such a time, uh, we, we step back, you know, uh, we take two steps back before we publish a, a, a really acerbic dissent or a really acerbic majority opinion, take, you know, because these charges mm -hmm. and counter charges mm -hmm. go both ways when this happens. So uh, I don't, you, you tell me, this is, are people just more polite on the Canadian Supreme Court? <laughs> Most. Uh, my concern about the tone issue in the American Supreme Court, and has been for a long time, is it has a supply side impact on the rhetoric other courts use and the rhetoric lawyers may feel is appropriate. And so when it happens on our court, there is, we're very conscious and try really hard to see if we can be persuading colleagues or they try to persuade us. Can you take that out? Yeah. Um, so we you do have a, a, uh, a, a, when people, sometimes people will call each other and say, listen, could you take out yeah. the sentence? Could you take out this line? And I think almost always people do. But we have a pretty high bar for when those calls yeah. are made. Right. Uh, so there is even worse than you see, believe me, uh, because, uh, because things do. Uh, I, I, I think it's it, it, very, very rare that such a call would be made and the person would say, no, this is absolutely integral to what I want to say, so I'm going to keep it in exactly as written. I think almost always people change it, people drop it, um, but probably our bar is higher for what counts probably. as as uh, out of bounds. Can I ask you one more question? Do I have time, Dean, for one more question? So Solicitor General, uh, scholar, dean of a law school, um, jurist on the Supreme Court of the United States. If somebody s said to you, Justice Kagan, you've done so much in so many areas, what, what would you like people to see as your legacy? What would your answer be? Um, Other than our friendship. <laughs> That's very important to me. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> we'll do that afterwards, okay. all right? All right. Uh, you know, I could answer that question for jobs I've had. You know, you can say to me, what do you hope your legacy was as dean of Harvard Law School? And I could give you a reasonable answer to that question. I can't answer that question for this job. I mean, I'm, I'm curious whether you can. I feel as though, this is my beginning of my ninth year, so it's not as though I'm a rookie anymore. Nine years? Yeah, I'm not, rookie. yeah. Uh, well, that, <laughs> that short, I think I was going to say something like that. Like not even, a rookie. <laughs> Very he, old, in uh -huh, fact. Uh -huh. How many years? Three years left. How many years? I've been a judge for 42 years. How many judge on the Supreme Court? 15. Uh -huh. uh, Still good. <laughs> want to know where I get my haircut? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say I don't want to think that way about what I'm doing now. I think I want to do it case by case, sitting by sitting, year by year, try to figure out you know, as I, you know, I think you have to reflect a little bit on where you've been, where you're going. But I don't want to say this is how I want to be remembered. For me, uh, that would, you know, deprive me of the ability to take it a case at a time and to really try to think in that case at that moment, what's the right answer? Um, and you know, I'll let the legacy stuff take care of itself. It will. Well, thank you. It was such a pleasure. Those are hard questions. It's not over yet. We have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, there's a mic on either arm. Um, you, you are great. You, uh, to come forward with your So I wrote out my question just to make it coherent. Uh, so, Justice Kagan, do you think that, given the duty of a judge to apply the law impartially and to some extent unbeholden from public opinion, that the politicization of the federal hearing process does more harm or good? Well, that's kind of Justice Abella's first question. We could just go back to the beginning and rerun this tape. Uh, yeah, I think I, uh, you know, I think I had, uh, I, 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 I said was, what I had to say about that. Yeah. yeah, can I say that? Is that like, can you, you wanna? Can. You can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming to the law school to speak with us today. Uh, I almost regret to ask this question, but I feel like I have to just because. Uh, oh, that, we're in trouble now. <laughs> we're in trouble. I have to ask the question. Um, just because the I. The great thing is I don't have to answer it. <laughs> Like and you're leaving town. So. <laughs> um, I and many of my female classmates, as well as my professors and people that I know in the legal profession, watched the, the hearings involving your colleague, Justice Kavanaugh, with a little bit of pain in our hearts. I'm wondering what you think the role of the Supreme Court is uh, and how it can be considered legitimate uh, in its treatment of women who have experienced violence when you have not one but two justices who have been leveled with credible ac accusations and the appointment process has put them forward. You know, you're, you were right. You should not have asked me that question. And I'm sorry to, you know, say that, uh, but, you know, there are some questions that uh, I'm a part of this institution. I care about it a lot. I care about my colleagues a lot. And uh, that's uh, something that I'm not going to be talking about. Okay, thank you. I have a backup question. It's totally different. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you see the Supreme Court's role um, in the context of the current Florida recount and in light of some of the controversies that have happened in the past? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if any, anything is going to get to us or in what context it will get to us. Um, these, uh, the, these, these, these questions about how the election system uh, works in the various states are always very complicated, in, in part because uh, 50 states have 50 different ways of running their election systems, and they are a combination of federal law and state law. Federal law, which the Supreme Court does have something to say about, state law, which it does not. 
Um, and uh, so sometimes we get involved in these questions, and, and sometimes not at all. Some, you know, sometimes even if, it's a, even if it's a question for courts, it's actually only a question for state courts. And so there are all these complicated situations about, you know, is this a question for uh, judicial resolution at all, or do we let the political processes kind of take care even of uh, very politically, con you know, even of or especially of politically controversial um, uh, uh, issues about how the election system is running. And then even if it is something that a court might have something to say about because in the end you need somebody to make a decision. Uh, as I said, a lot of the time it's, it's a matter for state law rather than for uh, federal law. So, so, um, uh, so I don't know if, any of, uh, if anything will ever get to us uh, on, on, on any of this. I mean, in general, uh, the court has had a lot of work to do in, 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 in the area uh, over the last number of years about whether certain kinds of election systems uh, are consistent with the federal constitution. Um, things like um, voter ID laws or, th you know, at any time a, a state changes its election system, somebody can come forward with a federal constitutional claim about it. And so there's, we've run a pretty uh, depressing, thriving business <laughs> in trying to figure out what states can do and what states can't do with respect to uh, structuring their electoral systems. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very hard because they're about like, there are thousands of permutations, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, voter ID system, what kind of voter ID system, you know, where do you get your IDs, where do you, you know, how easy does it have to be made to get IDs? Do you have voter IDs? We're not as strict as you are. Uh -huh. uh, well, I would say you're not as strict as some places in, in as, I mean, the thing as, about the United States is that it's like 50 states do things all kinds of different ways. Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, in, in our country, the question of, uh, of, of race in the electoral system is something that constantly rears its head. Um, uh, uh, in, in part uh, as a matter of constitutional law, in part, or so it used to be, as a matter of statute, the Voting Rights Act. Um, we recently had a very important case, which I wound up in the dissent on, mm -hmm. uh, striking down a provision of the Voting Rights Act, which served, I believe, as an important protector of minority voting rights. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, uh, yeah, we do a pretty healthy business in trying to figure out what is legitimate and what is not in a world in which uh, there are, it just seems that there are just so many variety of ways for political actors to, uh, construct electoral systems, some perfectly legitimate, some not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justices. Uh, Justice Kagan, I mean, other than your haircut and possibly how Justice Bader is doing after that fall, um, my question is in relation to your comment about the role of institutions of governance like the Supreme Court being a force for good and bringing people together in times of discord and, and divisions and I think this is it in, in recent history one of the times when I think the American populace has been quite divided. I, I want to say something I know you're getting to a question but I want to say something just because of the way you framed that and I think uh, I mean I, 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 I did say something quite like that but I want to make clear that this is all in the context of you have to do your job Right, your mm -hmm. job, and maybe this is one mm -hmm. of the things that you were saying, that your job is deciding legal questions, and uh, and deciding legal questions that people need answers to, and um, so we're not in the business of um, you know bringing together a fractured American public. I do think that there are ways of doing your job, which is thinking about law, interpreting law, applying law resolving legal questions that are more or less conducive to uh, which, which more or less exacerbate divisions mm -hmm. within the country and 
and that is not inconsistent with the judicial role to think about such things, to think about the context in which we're operating. I think that we should want judges to do that. There was a debate, if I could say, that this is, this is the point that was made when Roe v. Wade was decided. And there were those who said it should have come not from the court. It was something that should have done, uh, come from the ground up, and the, the government should have made sure that this was uh, legislation rather than judicial fiat. And that's an open debate. I know that one of your colleagues feels very strongly that it should not have been done by the courts. And there are others who say, if you hadn't done it, we might still be there and waiting. So it's either way, there is a division in public opinion. And I guess you just sometimes have to choose which side of the division you want your judgment to fall on. And I guess following up on, on your comment, uh, do, are you hopeful for then the judiciary's role, the Supreme Court's role in this time to maybe bring together, bringing people together is too strong language, but to be a force for consensus in, in these fractured times? Yeah, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to say that we should think of our like primary mission, you know, force for consensus. I, uh, I think primary mission is to decide legal questions, uh, to, to interpret, apply, think about uh, uh, the law. But, uh, but you know, am, am I hopeful that as we do that, we recognize that um, we, we, uh, that, uh, we should not uh, pour fuel on the fire and uh, to the contrary, that we should try where we can, consistent with our primary role of law interpretation and law application, where we can of helping to build bridges across some of the divides in American society. Yes, I'm hopeful of that. Thank you. I also wrote down my question. Um, You've touched on this a bit with the other questions and through your conversation with Justice Abella, but I was wondering how the Supreme Court has, like, has had to navigate concerns about remaining nonpartisan in the eyes of the public, especially in the face of increased politicized rhetoric from the nomination process all the way through confirmation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm feeling a little bit as though I'm, I'm repeating myself. Clearly, this is the question of the day, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, I, th I think maybe I'm more curious about you, like you said, you do your jobs, you interpret the law, but when you come all together, is there a sense of how will this be perceived by the public and like does sort of politics ebb in to the everyday job as it seems to have in the sort of context surrounding the job? Yeah, so when, if, if you were a fly on the wall in our conference room, uh, I think you would find that 98% of the time, we talk, we, we, we talk in the way uh, you talk when you're in law class. You know, we talk about the law. We talk about how to interpret the law. We talk about uh, decisions that the court has previously announced, what they mean. We talk about history. We talk about um, uh, precedent. We talk about, you know, all the things that you talk about when you f are facing a hard legal issue. And, and uh, you know, so, 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 so that's what we debate, that's what we discuss. These bigger concerns about institutional legitimacy, about uh, the way in which the court can either do something that appears to others to be politicized or not, um, that's a, a, a very small, teeny tiny part of what we do. And, and I think that that's basically right, mostly we should talk about law and try to discuss and debate and convince each other uh, about uh, uh, law. But, but nobody who's, you know, nobody can live in this world and not be aware of some broader context. And uh, I think the, to the extent, you know, sometimes we talk about that, sometimes it's just the 
the thing that we all know and we don't have to talk about. Uh, 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 but you know, I mean, the, the, the American Supreme Court, as I'm sure is true of the Canadian Supreme Court as well, is mostly a bunch of uh, people who are really good at um, thinking and talking about law and who really like thinking and talking about law, spending a lot of time thinking and talking about law. <laughs> so that's what you know our primary job is. I think there's a danger too, if I can step in. This is a, you know, the whole trick about whether the judges should be catering to, conscious of, uh, taking into account public opinion is a trick question because I don't know who the public is. Um, I don't know how you gauge public opinion. I don't know that it's even our job to try to figure out what public opinion is um, because we're not necessarily a majoritarian institution that has to cater to what the majority in the public wants. So to put it to the court, are you taking into sufficient account public opinion? Uh, if, you, if you unpack that, you're dealing with a shibboleth. I mean, what, what are you left with except, as uh, Justice Kagan says, you have to do your best to interpret the law the way you think it should be interpreted and hope that over time it will prove to be the right decision. But you can't, you can't pitch it to the agitations of the moment. It's just not a stable source of intellectual invigoration. Why don't you speak together, both of you at the same time? Uh, yeah. I, I think you might have been first, actually. Thank you, Justices, for being here. Uh, Justice Kagan, uh, you talked about how the fact that the court had an even number of justices for almost two years, uh, a fact external to the substance of a case, did cause the decision-making process to to adjust to that fact. And I was wondering, th the fact that the court seems to lack, uh, after uh, Justice Kennedy's retirement, seems to lack um, a swing vote, uh, someone in the middle. Uh, it, it, in recent years, it al al always had someone. Like it had Justice Powell or Justice Stevens or Justice Anthony Kennedy, but, but not anymore. Uh, how, how important it is to have a swing vote and how is the court's decision-making process likely to be affected by the fact that it no longer has one? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, there's no question that Justice O'Connor and then Justice Kennedy played an important role on the court and, um, and, and did so in part. They were, they, were very, they were two actually pretty different justices, but they, uh, 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 Justice O'Connor was by nature just a kind of um, centrist and she could sort of find the middle of every issue. And that, that was where she felt most comfortable. Uh, Justice, Justice Kennedy was actually a little bit different. Justice Kennedy just had a, 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 an, an eclectic set of views so that he, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, and, and like, I mean, Justice Kennedy had a, a very coherent set of legal principles. They were just principles that he shared with, um, some people on some things and other people on other things. So he wasn't like a centrist or a median justice in the way that Justice O'Connor was, but he, he did, it, 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 it did keep the court looking as, you know, so it, it, it was, you didn't know what side it was going to uh, come down on. And, and both of those people played an enormously important role on the court. And, uh, and it's, it's going to be hard to know what the new court is like. Um, uh, and and I, th I think it's, it's just too soon to tell uh, how we will function uh, without somebody who, who uh, is, is, is naturally in one of those modes. I mean, it could be that somebody will become such a justice, or it could be that they won't, but, uh, but, but that even the absence of such a person can just affect institutional dynamics in ways that are hard to predict. So, so I don't know what will happen. And uh, uh, you know, I think American court watchers will say that this is a really interesting time to think about our institution because 
because you know, you know, for the first time in quite some time, uh, not all the attention will be on one person. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, both of you, for being here, for your wonderful conversation and your answers to those questions. It's been a real privilege and an honor to have you both here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.